Thanks, Phil. Uh, we miss you. <laughs> Phil's awesome, as you guys all know. Uh, okay, so the very first thing I need to tell you is that uh, this is the number of hours I've, of sleep I've had this week. So, <laughs> so if uh, it's a little loopy, that's why. Um, when, I, when I gave Doug the title of this, I knew what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure how far I was going to get, so I left it super vague. Uh, so I did get to something that I could show that I would call an ELSA 2.0. So we're going to we're going to get to that. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's let's dig in. All right. So we'll start at kind of the beginning. And this was this was fun for me, uh, sort of <laughs> digging through my email to kind of do some archaeology to see just you know kind of how ELSA got to now. Um, so the fir very first traces of ELSA are back in 2009. Um, and I was doing some preliminary, preliminary work in my last job in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this is, uh, first of all, can everybody in the back see the text, the font? Uh, good. So I love this font um, for a uh, airhead. Can anyone tell me where this font is from? Uh, it's like that font. This is actually more specific. No. Uh, this is from a game called Overwatch. Oh. Ah. oh. Uh, yeah. I love it. Um, so, and I, what I love about this font is that it says future. So that's, that's what I was going for here. Um, but normally when I do talks, I try to mix in funny stuff. So I kind of had to balance that a little bit. And I'm trying to keep you guys awake here uh, after consuming some amazing barbecue. Uh, so in 09, uh, that was the preliminary work. And there's... I tried everything under the sun, and if you want to know why ELSA has so many lines of code in it, and we'll go into this a little bit deeper, uh, it's because none of these were, were good enough. Um, so Splunk was kind of, I would say, the inspiration. There were things I liked about it. Uh, you know, the, the sort of bash style query was, was great. Um, I didn't, it was too slow for what the volume that we were trying to work with, and we didn't have a budget for it. So I said, I like the thing where you search with bars, and that's about it, so give me the rest of it. And then there wasn't a thing. Um, I looked at some of the stuff out there, uh, gray logs and the others, um, they, they weren't doing it for me. So I set out to write my own for my, my IR team. And that's kind of one of the other things is also came from, you know, by an IR team for an IR team. That was the initial reason for being. Uh, so Splunk was out, um, Mongo was, I mean, it's probably better now, but back then it was a total uh, not good fit for this. Um, HBase was interesting at the time, but too slow. Uh, Couch was just ridiculously too slow. Um, ES was, was very young back then, and it needed a ton of disk space and RAM. Uh, the speed wasn't great, but it was passable. Uh, so eventually I settled on Sphinx. Uh, and that is because it is still uh, very, very fast at indexing. Uh, and that was a the primary requirement. I had very little hardware to operate on, so that was, that was key. And then the other thing was that it didn't have a memory restriction when you were doing searching for the most part. It would not require much memory, so that made a, a good fit. So you do big queries, keep it on you know, small commodity hardware. Um, I also just liked the, the management of it. It was you know, solid, it was just one thing. You tell it to index something, it would index it, and then it's done, and then you know where it is. I really enjoyed that part of it, because uh, it made it easy to figure out uh, you know, what was right and what was wrong. Uh, and then it had some really good support for uh, quoted operators like a followed by B followed by C. So that was a big reason for going with it. And uh, I think it, looking back, I think it's definitely still the right decision. Uh, so uh, in 09 and 010, um, I did the sort of first production release and at the state. And that was a big hit all throughout, not just for our, our it kind of had that Splunk effect where it wasn't just uh, security. We had uh, you know production systems being monitored that way. You know How many requests were we getting? We needed dashboards, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that started, it started to need to scale a little bit, and it in fact did. Um, so then I thought, well, this might be good enough for others. And I've, I look back, and in my email, January 17th, to, uh, 2011, was the first commit to Google Code, from what I could tell, because it's not there anymore, so you have to kind of use <laughs> the uh, email about it. Uh, and then in August 2012, and this is prob probably the most important to all of you, that's when it went into Security Onion. And I did get a kick out of reading sort of the, the back and forth. It was about a six month process. Um, and a, a big shout out to Scott Reynolds. I don't know, he's not here uh, for, for this year, but um, 
he, he probably had about this many hours of sleep for several weeks trying to get like the 100 plus curl modules installed. And uh, so if you guys think you owe me, you probably owe him bigger. Because <laughs> uh, that's, oh man, that was, that was a nightmare. Um, so that, and a good lesson learned. But that's when we got sort of the, the bigger stuff, uh, the dashboards, the macros, uh, some of the really interesting things that kind of made it more than, than uh, your basic stuff. And then uh, more lately, I uh, switched jobs, and so it, it kind of had to go into maintenance mode. Um, I also had some small things that eat in the middle there, so that kind of uh, it was a factor. Um, but it's still, you know, I, I liked it, but I, what I had been finding was um, it was getting harder and harder to work on. So it went into more of a maintenance mode. And at the same time, uh, and I'm, I looked back at my slides from 2014, you know, there was this, the big elephant in the room was elk, and it still is. Uh, elk is still out there and still an okay use case. It's kind of like Splunk now, where it's like you can use it for this kind of stuff. It's not a perfect fit, but you can shoehorn it. Um, and it, it was still slow and resource hungry. So that kind of got me thinking uh, when I, I was like, man, why is it, you know, I, I have this decision to make. Should I just kind of cede to Elk and let it kind of do its thing or, or Splunk and, you know, like, just kind of a good enough scenario. And it's like, you, you can do that. Um, but what was the point of ELSIP? So one of the things was the nodes were supposed to be all over the place, like keep the node as close to the data as possible. So this was very true in a lot of environments I was in and some of the other people that uh, I'd kind of helped get up and running. Um, campuses are a great example. So they would do a thing where there'd be an ELSIP box per department and then they'd have like a master ELSIP you could query all the stuff with. And you wouldn't have a ton of logs traversing the network um, works great for WAN links. So I wanted to, I'm like, that's, that's not something you can get with those other things. So that's still kind of a, a reason for it. Uh, but the main thing was that it was analyst focused. So again, you know, by IR for IR, that's the main thing. And I'm like, you know, really we're, we really were trying to focus on the workflow. So I thought, all right, what, what are we gonna do here? Uh, and then visualizations were becoming more and more important. And not sort of just the, okay, we have some and that should be good enough. These are visualizations people need to work with. Uh, they're not just kind of CISO dashboard things. Like these are things that need to be valuable uh, to the to the analysts, I should say. Not that the CISO dashboards aren't valuable because everybody needs you know checks, but um, that you still need to actually do the job, right? And there's also a, a team aspect to it. Um, so I had the privilege at my last job in an IR team sitting next to the people. A lot of IR teams don't get to sit next to each other. They have shifts. There needs to be some sort of way to communicate what's going on. So uh, this is an insanely preliminary prototype. Uh, do not worry about the aesthetics. What I want to focus on today are the core components and why they're there. Uh, so the first top graph, it should look very familiar to everyone because it's in like a ton of different things. It's your basic time histogram and it shows, okay, you did a search and like here's your stuff. Like that's, that's been a part of many products since, you know, mid 2000s. But it's just kind of how you need to do things, right? It all serves as a nav bar. I did one other thing here, and it's a little hard to make out. Um, I'm gonna try to do a demo of this at the end. Uh, we'll, we'll see uh, how, many, how far we got in my hours of sleep. Um, so hopefully you'll get a little bit closer look at this in a minute. Um, but the, uh, the, there's two uh, dimensions being graphed here. One is uh, volume by class, and that's stacked, and then one is volume by host, uh, or sorry, the host is stacked, and then the, the, there's individual lines for the class. And that's something I learned over the last few years is that um, just seeing the histogram of events is, is nice, but if you can show some other things in there, you're saving time. So that was one of the other things. Again, it's like knowing what the analyst is going to be doing before, you know, ahead of time, because this isn't just for the general public, this is for security professionals. And then in the middle, uh, and if you go to my B-Sides talk tomorrow, I'll talk about this just a teeny bit, but this is my favorite visualization of all time and the most useful thing like ever <laughs> from a visualization standpoint. And uh, again, I'll talk about it tomorrow a little bit, but it's because you can read the labels, uh, you get sort of vertical pie charts, so you understand the dimensions, and you get an actual navigable interface. Uh, I prefer this versus, um, you see the radial pie charts, that's a lot of, uh, like Elk has that one. And those are like fun to look at, but you have to like hover over everything to see what's going on. This is a cross between a table and something pretty, and I, I like that about it a lot. Uh, so I started met, uh, messing around with these uh, about a year ago, and I started finding I just prefer doing everything in these. 
Um, so in this example, I'm doing a, a pipe to uh, Sankey up there. So it's a query and then a group by and then a pipe to a visualization and just, you know, standard bash style. Um, I, I began liking it so much that could become the default. You know, that might be something people like. So uh, I would prefer it that way and maybe that would be a preference. Um, and then in the bottom, uh, this is the grid view. Uh, one of the very first features that people requested was grid view. And at the beginning, I'm like, oh, that's gonna be messy. Um, and you know, I heard loud and clear that no, grid view is just better because you can keep things literally straight. Uh, so I just, in this version, it's just a mega grid view and you have to you know, scroll way over. Um, however, there's a little bit of column sorting involved, just a teeny bit, just the basics to keep them on the left. Uh, so you only really have to scroll over if you're looking for something specific. And what I found was if you just kind of alter your search a little bit, then you don't have to scroll over at all. Um, so that was kind of uh, helpful. Um, then on, on the left are some other interesting things that I'm going to talk about here because you probably can't even read those, and that's fine. Uh, but they are sort of the keeping things straight. Uh, and that's, that's another very important part. And then I will say, because I'm not sure just how much demo we'll have. In the upper right corner is more of a status indicator, and this was a very early screenshot. Uh, by very early, I mean uh, two days ago when, <laughs> when only like 70% of the code was there um, and 0% of the slides. <laughs> uh, I had to have the stuff to talk about before I could talk about it. Uh, so uh, this is 2.0. This is so this is written completely from the ground up. Uh, and the, there's a, a number of big reasons for that. And the, the biggest first reason is that there, there was such an emphasis on bending over backwards to make the, the Sphinx schema fit for the performance that the code, I think there's like 40 or 50,000 lines in ELSA, it's huge. And it's, it's hard for me to even code on it. I cannot expect anyone else to contribute code in that kind of environment. That's just ridiculous. Uh, so it's time to take another look at it. Um, there's, there's nothing technically wrong with Perl. I just the, in, in the company I'm in now, we do everything in Python, and you know it's it's uh, it has everything Perl has and more. So um, you know I there's still people release a ton of stuff in Perl, so I'm never going to throw Perl under the bus. Um, but Python does the job, and more people know it. Um, and they stopped at 5.8 in Perl, so you know sorry. Um, so I switched over. I'm not too sad about that. Uh, there's a ton of less code already. I could tell. Um, more, of course, more will go in after just a you know initial POC, but just by inherently switching that is, is already looking much better, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's more accessible to everyone else. Uh, this is the interesting thing: a Cabanable, compa Cabana compatible Elasticsearch backend. This is the new part, and I'll explain in just a little bit here why that decision was made. Uh, I'm actually not exactly changing my mind, um, but that's that was sort of the other thing: is this is a security tool? If you want basic dashboards. Writing the widgets for all the dashboards is time-consuming work that other people can do. Uh, you can export a Cabana dashboard in an iframe. So just go into Cabana, do your thing, and then you got your CISO dashboard, and then we get on to the real work. Uh, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> uh, so let's leave that to them. Because uh, Cabana is a fine thing. It's just not built for security. Uh, and I actually looked at doing a plugin, and it's horrendous. Uh, that was my first thought, like, don't reinvent the wheel, let's just see if we can do some workflow. No. And they change major versions like every six months, and yeah, it's not a good scenario. Um, so maybe if they settle down with that, uh, it would be feasible, but for now, there's, there's no reason to. Um, and then lastly, uh, again, because it's not Sphinx with a hard schema, and we, we heard earlier today the limits of 12 fields, um, which I still, I still say is a pretty good number that managed for most cases, but not all. And as we get more into the host-based stuff, you, you can't always predict everything. Um, I'm still a strong believer in a taxonomy for IR work, uh, but you can define the taxonomy in the parsing. So the parsers haven't really changed. Uh, so those are sort of the, the big items, but I think there's still a lot more to delve into. Uh, so the current state of it is I have a functional prototype. It is on GitHub. Um, you can mess around with it. It will mostly work, but I'm going to be changing so much in the next like week or two that I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that. What I'm, and I'll have a, sort of the call to action at the end. So we'll, we'll talk more about the sort of timeline then. Um, so for roadmap, uh, we want to complete all the ELSA features that are still relevant and important. Um, that's definitely uh, you know, job one. Um, but at the same time, uh, we want to finalize what I'm calling a transcript, and we'll go into that in depth shortly. And then. 
maybe it would be cool to have a transcript exchange. I don't know. We'll see. So these are sort of the governing factors uh, for two. Uh, so first of all, let's be methodical about it. And it's not a, a coincidence that I think this way, having worked uh, with and for Chris now for some time. And uh, I've definitely had a lot of good things rub off on me there. And so this idea that there is a method to how you uh, go through an incident is really critical. And it got me thinking that there's, there needs to be better documentation for how that occurs. So there's a deliberate focus on the incident state tracking as the analyst is working. And what's funny is I hadn't seen Chris's slides until last night. And I'm like, this is a perfect dovetail because the, the research that he's been doing um, is, is, you know, this is the other side of the coin of that. Uh, so having these workflow transcripts as a, like a, a real document, I thought was just stop. Instead of doing dashboards, we can do that. And then we can let the other stuff do the dashboards. So that, that's kind of the, the idea there. And then I'm hoping that this can become more social, that you can share these things. You can have the exchange. So I don't know. That's still, I mean, that depends on the community. So we'll see if that becomes a reality. Uh, for me right now, that's a goal. And then third, of course, be analytical. Uh, so this is, again, this is purpose built. This is not supposed to be a general tool. And that's, we should take advantage of that. There are general tools available if you need those. Um, but this can be built upon those general tools. So the, uh, the first big thing I had to do was, <laughs> was embrace the horror of Elasticsearch. Uh, I have had a front row seat to this horror for some time. Um, it can be, it is amazing uh, what it can do uh, when you, you feed the beast. Um, and that, that is true. Now there, there was an interesting thing that happened though, um, late last year and mostly this year. So the 2.0 branch of Elasticsearch uh, changed a very important thing. Uh, the first reason you couldn't use it for something else alike was that if you had a query that was too big, it would be like, out of memory, your fault, not mine, I'm out. And that was it. It would just leave you hanging. Uh, the field cache is, is what I'm talking about for the, the sub 2.0 stuff. They changed that and they added what's been in Sphinx the whole time called doc values, which is storing that stuff on disk uh, instead of in memory. And that allows you to do much bigger queries without running out of RAM. Now, the reason they didn't do it initially is like, oh, well, that's so slow. You can't run 1,000 requests per second that way. It's like, well, that we're not. We're running like one request every like minute. So that's totally fine for our, our use case. So that's why it took them so long to do it. Um, and that's built into uh, ES. And they're, they're using a lot of those features in Lucene 5. Uh, one of those is using ZLib instead of LZ4, I think, which uh, reduces the footprint quite a bit. Uh, that made it a little more palatable. Uh, and then. The, uh, the types of queries that you can do, uh, those really haven't changed, but I think that the, the necessity for those has really presented themselves. Uh, so uh, I would say that, and this is very debatable, um, I think that Sphinx is probably still more efficient, but ES is basically close enough now that the giving up some of the performance is worth it for the features it adds, and certainly for the um, tens of thousands of lines of code I don't have to write. Uh, that seems pretty worth it to me. Um, I'll probably have some benchmarks out in a little bit, but uh, it's definitely uh, worth doing at this point. And like I said, 90% of ELSA code is dealing with, oh, let's resolve the real program name to a program ID to save like a little bit of disk. And when you do it over billions of events, it's a lot of disk, um, but it's at the cost of feature development. Uh, and I, I, I'd heard from a lot of people that did not have enormous uh, ELSA installations, and that kind of performance wasn't critical to them. So I'm trying to make sure this is more valuable to more people uh, with some, some better uh, choices on, on what we spend our time on. All right, so there's a couple of sort of handy ones that I'm hoping pan out. Um, so one is the more like this function, which is not very well known. I, I didn't find it until I was delving through the ES docs. Uh, it's actually a similarity analysis for a given document, and I'm like, that sounds helpful. So I was messing around with that, and it works. Uh, works pretty well. Um, I don't know what the speed will be yet. I haven't done full benchmarks on it, but it could be valuable. Uh, it's another kind of bonus for 2.0. Um, and then uh, the nested aggregations, they've been there for a while, uh, but really taking advantage of those is, is key. Uh, they also have um, dynamic templates, so that means that you, if you look at the config right now, it's about yay big because it can just specify sort of the, the things that are weird and everything else can have the same defaults. Um, and then I do kind of an interesting thing where I take uh, the values and I store them again to make sure when you're doing your group by it makes sense. That's kind of in the weeds on ES stuff, but that's necessary. 
Um, so that, that is a new thing you can do. And then engrams are especially interesting. Uh, so that's not just like a wild card, it means punctuation, spaces, all of that. You could take any, I think I'd put it at five characters right now, any five characters anywhere in an analyzed string and it'll find it, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and that gets you some very interesting stuff, especially when you have like top level domain, subdomain, something interesting in, inside a URI or in a domain and then something else. Um, you can just take that middle part out of anywhere and run it. Uh, now, that said, if you go through the ES docs, there are a ton of features which are not built for security or anything like what we're trying to do. Um, uh, percolation's an, a good one. That's not a good way to do alerting. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't scale too well on, on any kind of data size. Um, and there's a bunch of them like that. Suggestions, score boosting, there's a lot of it, still features going into Elasticsearch that are for you know, the, the, you know, the search community at large as opposed to security stuff. They're more aware of security uh, use cases now than they ever were. Um, so you're, and that kind of drove things like the doc values. Uh, but there's still definitely stuff in there that we don't want to use. Um, but here's the biggest thing. So ES is, I mean, that's the whole point. It's supposed to be elastic. And it's, it, it doesn't like to be elastic, is the way I would put it. Uh, it gets real angry when it has to talk to more <laughs> friends. So if you put, if you got a cluster of like 10 nodes and you put an 11th in there, they'll spend like a whole day shuffling stuff around. And that is not always a great thing. And moreover, it's one more thing that the security personnel have to figure out or teach ops have, have to figure out. Uh, anytime you have a cluster technology, just assume that there's gonna be at least one FTE plus a backup associated with maintaining that cluster. Uh, so I'm like, well, do we need it to be clustered? What if we just kind of had them sit on their own? Because that's how I did it in Sphinx and that seemed to work really well. Um, merging results is not a particularly difficult thing to do. Uh, so, and especially we wanted this goal of having geo-distributed nodes, well you can't have an ES cluster with a WAN link, it just won't work because they're going to try to push all their data across the WAN link. But the, you can still put the data in ES, right? So we want something um, to distribute that. So I have a tiny little uh, project I put up called FED, short for Federate, Federation. Um, I don't even have a readme on there yet. Uh, this is uh, a plugin based search proxy, is what it, it is. But the, the most important plugin in there is the Elasticsearch plugin for now. And there's also an Archive Search one in there. Um, oh, so Archive Search now is just gzip JSON. Like, we'll just do raw files. Uh, no, no MySQL at, at, at all. <laughs> there's no MySQL. Nothing against MySQL, it's just not necessary for this. Um, and it's one more thing you got to admin. Now I need a username and password. Now I need all this stuff. Uh, so trying to keep it as simple as possible and just stay focused on the security aspect. Uh, so Fed will take your queries and it can either recursively route that to another uh, federated instance. Uh, so if you imagine each one of those Fed boxes at a different uh, company site, um, that would make a lot of sense. And as you can see, one Fed instance can talk to multiple ESs. Here's the interesting thing. Any one of those ESs can be a full cluster if you want it to be. It's just talking to the HTTP interface. Uh, the amount of code in Fed is very, very short. It's like maybe 300 lines. It's just a, a proxy, uh, but it, it does a async parallel out there. So you can <laughs> query all the things at once, just like you're used to in Elsa, bring them all back, and the things in the middle don't have to really care about what they're talking to, uh, which is kind of the requirement. Um, so you can, where it says Elsa, that could be Cabana. You can point Cabana at this and have ES nodes all over the world that have no idea the other ones exist, and Cabana will work out of the box. Uh, so again, want that so that I don't have to worry about dashboards. You got your dashboards now, that's not a problem. Uh, all right. um, so on SysLogNG, uh, this helps a lot with the parsers. Uh, you guys all know and love parsers. No more I0 and S0. Um, now you can just put exactly what you want in there and you don't have to get confused about it. And you're basically defining your taxonomy in the parser schema. So uh, it's still really important to be able to parse things when they're coming in <laughs> structured. Um, there will be an opportunity to rewrite certain fields for things that are coming in natively JSON, um, but it's, it's a lot easier to do it this way. Um, oh, everything is native JSON. So this ELSA.py that's in there now, it just reads from standard in. So you can take JSON and send it to ELSA.py and it'll get it to Elasticsearch so you can do offline stuff that way. Uh, it's like this much code, that part's easy. Um, and then as a nice little addition, uh, depending on your licensing situation, you can throw MaxMind on there. Uh, and you can have uh, automatically GIP decorated logs as they come through, so you don't have to pipe them to the GIP destination, which is great for a lot of those dashboards. 
Uh, this is the other kind of interesting thing. So about two months ago, I started using dashboard or uh, containers quite a bit, and I'm really late to the game on that. I didn't really have a reason to use containers before. Uh, now I love them just because they're so easy to move stuff from one place to another. Um, so Fed is now now as a container. I put that out on um, Docker Hub, so you could just do Docker pull MC Hosty Fed, and you'll have it running. Uh, so that that was kind of helpful and then just like I can run this stuff on my laptop and I can run it on my desktop And that's it's a great way to do it. Yes, and syslog and G have uh, official um, Docker repos for that and the reason I'm telling you guys this right now is more for when I have a call to action for Helping me out on the beta. This is a great way to get started. So you don't spend like 10 years Seriously, okay. All right. We'll move Jeez. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting my sleep in. Uh, so yeah, containers. All right, this is the this is that's right. We'll, we'll get it. All right. So the action status I said in the upper right. Um, transcripts are going to be a way to do this. And the, the the whole idea here is that at least for me, because I don't sleep a lot, it's hard for me to remember things. And I'm trying to remember what in the world I was looking for in the first place. Like I started hunting on something and I went down a rabbit hole and I'm like, how did I get here? And I'm like looking through my search history. And also it's like you got a million tabs open and you're like, what do these mean? <laughs> so I'm proposing a new, a new model for this called the branch. I'm calling it a branch breadcrumb data model uh, where basically you, you declare actively that you're pivoting. And when you pivot, that gives you a whole new branch. And then that branch is basically a a document that you can use. The whole thing is a, a branch document, but each one of those uh, is, is something that declares, and we'll, I'll get in that in a second. Um, so each one of those times you said, I am going to either declare that I'm abandoning this line of questioning, or I've declared that I've found something. That's when you end your branch. And I think that's important because it gets out of your way. It's mostly automated, like with just a couple clicks, you don't have to like type, but that is a way to track what the analyst is thinking that we haven't had before. And um, back to Chris's talk, I think that's becoming more and more important. So I, I don't know if you'll be able to read all of this, but this is an example transcript. Um, and this is, again, very pre preliminary. I'm open to suggestions. This is how I thought about it to start with. Um, so the very first thing is a scope, and it says, I'm going to start hunting. That's what that says. And then I'm going to pivot because I saw something interesting. And then I'm going to do a bunch of work. I'm going to tag some things, going to make a note. And then I, I now want to look at the victim and see just how hacked they are or if they're truly hacked. Or identify there's a bad guy outside. Is this thing hacked? Pivot. So now that's, there's two ideas. One idea is we got a bad guy, and one idea is we need to know if the thing on the ground is hacked. So by separating those out of branches, now you have a better way to do that and to document it. And I'm just explain that. Uh, so this replaces the tab workflow. So each, the, the transcript on the right, you can click one, on each one of those, and it has the full query results and the query itself. Uh, locally, so when you click on it, it'll replace what you're looking at with that query. So you could just like go between them and have your results back, and it's locally cached. Doesn't have to rerun the query. Um, that saves you from having all the tabs, but you still get. It's kind of like if you had all the tabs vertically. It's kind of the way to think of it. Um, and then uh, let's skip that one. So scope it, again. You're declaring you're going to start a hunt, and this is. I'm not totally sold that we need something that says this, but I like the idea of saying. I'm interested in a general topic. We're going to start this, and that gives you a start and an endpoint. Um, I think being explicit about it can be helpful. On the other hand, if it, it is an action you didn't already have to take that you would now have to take, and that's kind of half the point. But it, you know, whether enough people are willing to do it, we'll see. Um, the pivot already talked about that, uh, and then declaring at the end, it, you're you're done with something, and it was either worthwhile or it wasn't. But this is kind of the so if we have this as a document, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with this. So now you can replay an entire investigation because you have all the queries, you have all the results, and you have everything the analyst was thinking. So now we can do quantifiable investigation performance. And I swear we did not coordinate on these slides. Uh, so, so you could do uh, competition. You could say, hey, I've got a sock of 50 guys. I'm going to do A, B. You guys work the same hunt, go. And then you prize for the winner or whatever. Um, so it's a little bit of gamification. Um, you can, if you're just by yourself, you can kind of time yourself, like how was I doing last week? And then you probably aren't interested in that, but you're probably definitely interested in showing your boss 
I can show a better response time with a new data source, and that goes directly to what Chris was talking about. So I didn't have OS data before. We just dropped our investigation times provably by 40% just by getting an additional data source. Now you justify the cost. Uh, then tags, so anytime you tag something, it'll show up in the results. It's on the sidebar on the left, so you can remember what you're working on. Anything you want, whether it's the admin's PC, whether it's a bad guy. Uh, and then favorites, this, I'm not sure that you're gonna want this. This is so you don't have to type in something for a tag. Um, we'll see how much you guys use that. Maybe it's uh, superfluous, but sometimes it's just nice for sort of an ephemeral thing to be like, you know, I'm not sure this is, I wanna pivot on this yet, but it might, so I'm gonna keep like three or four things favorited over here. All right, uh, oh, got just a few slides left, am I good? Okay. Oh yeah, visualizations, everyone's favorite. Not dashboards, visualizations. Uh, so the group histogram everyone loves. I sound so bitter, but I'm, I'm not, I just don't wanna do the dashboard. Um, so the group histogram, this is, so the thing that ES gives us with being able to group by multiple things at the same time, well, let's go ahead and put that in the same chart, right? Talked about at the very beginning. Now you have a great way to compare without having to do anything. It's just staring you right in the face. No clicking, no typing, it's just there. Um, so that's huge. Uh, it's all too easy. <laughs> and it allows uh, a lot of um, nav, so you, just what you expect, you click on a bar, it drills down. Um, talked about the sand key. So right now these are invoked with the name of the visualization. We could tweak that syntax, of course. Um, again, this is uh, very much a POC at the, at the moment. Um, but the interesting thing is I already have in there the context menu. Uh, so you can go to that visualization, uh, right click on it, and you'll have the list of pivot and all that stuff. So it's, it's built right in. And I, I love the cleanness. Um, and then everyone's favorite, the force directed graph. I have actually seen valid use cases for this. <laughs> Everyone loves to put them up there because they look great. Um, it's very difficult to make them useful if you're just throwing them out there willy nilly. Um, but there are definitely cases where it's valuable. Um, for instance, SSH logins, RDP logins, those are great ones to see where, where they're going, privileges, um, that kind of stuff. There's definitely a use case for it. Um, URI paths, uh, so you can map out um, refers with the URI path where the refer is the source. Uh, and then um, lastly, uh, the geo country map that's already in there, so I'm gonna want that um, because the one in Cabana is actually tiles. It makes no sense to me, I don't know, maybe they'll fix that. Um, all right, so timeline, uh, I'm prototyping right now. I wouldn't worry about contributing code right now because it's gonna dramatically change the next few weeks. However, I'll announce a beta in one to two months, and when I do, that's a time where uh, if the community can contribute code, that would be great, and that's when I'll ask for feedback. Uh, it's a little early for feedback because it's such an, so in flux right now. I already know that looks like junk. <laughs> so uh, there'll be a plenty on that. Uh, all right, how much time do I have, any? Three or four minutes, perfect. Perfect to, for a live demo to fail. All right, here we go. <laughs> Just enough time for something to go horribly wrong. All right, uh, so I have an ES uh, container running locally, um, some of these versions. So if I run, hey, look at that. Uh, so there's only one time frame, uh, but you can see all these things are spelled out for you. And then you got your transcript, which has happened. So if you're interested in something, let's say this IP is, oh, oh, I forgot to mention. This is the data, um, who was the second talk? I'm, I'm sorry, no sleep. Who was, they had the, the DNS logs? Eric Connors. Yes, thank you, <laughs> I'm so sorry, Eric, Eric, yes. Eric, this is uh, from your website, these are, this is the data from your talk. Um, so. <laughs> well, I wanted to see, like, okay, can we do it without cut? So, not quite yet. We need a little transform in there to pull the thing out. You still need cut, which I found very uh, um, important. Uh, but you get all the stuff out of there. So right away, if you're looking at what? Oh no! <laughs> but my demo is so awesome. <laughs> Where's your demo god now? <laughs> no demagoguery. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this is a challenge. Um, so you're on that green dot now. Yeah, I can barely see that. There we go. All right, so should have, uh, yeah, see so do this, you pivot, and then it runs the search, and now this data down here is actually that data that you pivoted on. And then if I'm lucky, in the upper right, you'll see what the pivot was, maybe. 
Yeah, there's some stuff in the upper right, isn't there? Yeah. 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 Um, and then you can tag. It's alive. Uh, and then if you want to tag, this tag. <laughs> and then it should show up there. Yeah. So then you got your tag up here. And then right now that's local, but of course that would be uh, server side. And then things coming through can get auto tagged. Um, you know, at ingest time, which would be nice. And it'd be great for you to be able to share that with your teammates, right? So teammates can live update that. So those are the kinds of things I'd like to work on instead of dashboards. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm done. Um, thanks. Uh, I'll be around here and uh, here to.